So going back to the other point, the advantages and disadvantages of this system, you start noticing a lot more. Part of the traveling discussion was uh, buying your dream life for cash. Do you remember that? So if you go around the world and you decide, okay, this is my heaven. This is, this is where I want to be forever. That's the place where you should be buying something for cash. But if you haven't got the cash, obviously you have to wait and figure out how to get that money to buy it. And when you've got that, what does it mean? Well, you can operate with total freedom because if you came back to the UK and the UK fell apart, what happens? Well, 99.9% .9 of the population are running around scrambling, trying to sort their lives out. What do you do? You jump in a car and go to Heathrow. And on the other side of the world, you've got your dream life. So when you're operating in the UK, you have zero risk. So when you walk into a meeting, and you're doing a negotiation and someone's haggling over a contract or hagg haggling over a price. You don't care. They care. But you don't. Because you've already got your dream life. So you sit there and you can negotiate, but who really cares? You just tell them what you want. And if they don't give it to you, you just walk out the room. And we'll have what happens nine times out of 10, you get what you want. <clears throat> because in that meeting and in life generally, when you're operating in that situation where you have the dream life, <clears throat> you don't panic. You don't worry. You don't have any anxiety. You don't show your hand of weakness. And the person who's negotiating with you over whatever doesn't pick up on your weakness. And because you're non-negotiable, they cannot negotiate with you. So they have no choice. They just always give in and give you what you want. It gives you a lot of strength. Like I noticed a massive difference. After I went traveling, I bought five properties around the world for cash. And when I came back, because I just didn't care, everything just came to me. I didn't go looking. Everything seemed to just work out all the time. And there wasn't any real discussions over prices or negotiations ever. It was just, that's what I want. If you don't like it, Heathrow Terminal 5. And they always give you what you want because they have no choice. You'll make much better decisions and you won't need to take unnecessary excessive risks. You'll absolutely not ever be required to have a lottery mentality. So where you're just all the time buying lottery tickets in different formats trying to get huge amounts of upside because you've got nothing and you're trying to get excessive amounts of money with excessive amounts of risk, looking to play the lottery all the time. You just won't need to. So it's something that you should really aim for, in my opinion, in your life. If you can get your dream life by 35, 40 years old, you're going to do excessively well in your 40s and 50s and 60s. Okay, principle number two, self-determination. So this one probably brought up the most questions in the comments section after the video went out over the last couple of years. Self-determination is the principle that underpins the two secrets of rent to own, so defining assets and liabilities properly, and building and owning your own infrastructure. 
So in terms of financial education and financial understanding, an asset and a liability, understanding what a perceived asset actually is. So people actually perceive certain things as assets when they're actually liabilities. And even after the video went out, it's unbelievable how many people still don't get it. Because it's, it really is just straight maths. And we use mortgages as the main example, okay? So let's start with a property, I don't know, somewhere down on this road. It's on the market for three million quid. If you get a mortgage, do you pay three million pounds for that property? No. You pay a hell of a lot more. So I'm going to show you now why it's at, it financially, why it's actually really dumb to have a mortgage. We can actually quantify because the, the first thing that a mortgage takes from you is your freedom because you have to pay it every month. And of course, I'm going to get onto the point in a second, but if you don't have a mortgage and you pay rent, you have to pay rent every month. Well, you don't. You can just leave. We'll get onto that in a second. So a mortgage takes your freedom. And right from the beginning, before you even sign the paper to take the mortgage, you can sit down and figure out what you value your freedom at, at that moment for the next 25, 30 years. With just a few assumptions. So let's use an example in the United States. Everyone knows the difference between a repayment and an interest-only mortgage. Do we know that? Most people should. If you don't know the difference between that, you need some help. A repayment mortgage, you're paying down the principal of the loan while you're paying the mortgage. Interest only, you're not. You're just paying the interest. So in the US, it's mostly repayment, vast majority, okay? In the UK now, it's fi about 50-50, repayments and interest only mortgages that are outstanding in the economy. But we're gonna use an example here, which is the best case scenario, which is a repayment mortgage, okay, in the US. So let's say, you find a property that's 500 grand and you put down a 75 grand deposit to buy the property. So you get a 425 grand mortgage. You sign all the papers, it's done. What do you own? Do you think you own that house? You own nothing. You own, over 30 years, a liability of 360 payments. That's what you own. If you miss one of those payments, the bank takes the property. So try to, I'd like to think of an image of a young couple who have just been married and the husband carries his new bride over the threshold and they're clinking glasses of champagne celebrating and they think they own their house. They own nothing. They've got a loan and 360 payments. That's what they've got. So let's assume a 3.75% interest rate over, I think this is 30 years, 360 months, right? So that's monthly payments of $1,968, okay? For 30 years. So over the full life of the mortgage, they're not paying 500,000 for the property. They're paying 708,000. But let's make an assumption. You know, the Western world assumption is that property just goes up forever. So let's put that assumption in and say, okay, after 30 years, the property is gonna be worth a million. Have you done, have you done well in that situation? Do you think you've done well in that situation? So you've paid over the 30 years, 708,000, property's worth a million, so you make a net 291 grand over 30 years. But you gave up your freedom in the process the whole time. 
So you obviously made money, that's undeniable, but you gave up your freedom in the process, okay? You were rewarded for giving up your freedom. But, and this is something that genuinely people don't understand, because the questions that come through, and also I'll prove to you about taking on the mortgage to rent out, is that an asset or a liability? I'll prove that's not true in a second. Um, but people just don't really get opportunity cost of capital. Because that 75 grand you, that you put down to buy the property as a deposit, okay? If you just compounded that at 10% per annum, doing something else, let's say you just invested it in something, you put it in a box and it made 10% every year. It compounds to 1.3 million over 30 years at 10%. So you have one situation where you're rewarded for giving up your freedom, but the whole time you have no freedom for 30 years. You have to make that payment every month because you don't own anything. You don't own it till the last payment of the 360, of the 360 months. So you got that one situation and you make, if it's worth a million, 291 grand. Or you stick it in a box and make 10% and you make 1.3 million. That's the second situation. There's opportunity cost of capital. So if you believe that you can actually make 10% per year on your money and live within your means, so obviously you don't go out and spend it all or even spend even more. Um, then the 500 grand property would have to increase in value by 1.3 million to pay for the opportunity cost of not putting it in the box that pays 10%. So it would have to increase by that value, the 1.3 million so it would have to be worth, at the end of 30 years, 1.8 million to pay for the freedom that you obtain by not having the mortgage. Does that make sense? So you make one choice, you can have the mortgage. You can tie up the 75 grand. So it's now there, tied up, and there's nothing you can do about it. Or you can put it in a box and make 10% per year. And it compounds. So the property would have to work by that much for you to basically not give up your freedom. As a minimum. Well, you've got to live somewhere. So let's assume you rent over the 30 years for 20 grand a year. So you live in your, well within your means. You would have spent 600 grand on rent. So you'd be left with 708 grand if you use that second situation and rent it, right? So when you compare the two scenarios, uh, you're richer over 30 years by the 708 grand, even when you're renting. And you have your freedom 100% of the time. And you have, so you have no liabilities and no debt to service. So basically, when you're taking the mortgage, what you're actually saying is, I'm, I'm willing to forego my freedom on day one for a price of 208 grand and you know going into it that you have 0% freedom over the 30 years because you have to make those monthly payments consecutively. And at the end of the 30 years, you can actually look back and say, well, what was my reward every year for 30 years? Nine grand, 9,700. If the property is worth a million. So if you wanna be smart about this, go and do a spreadsheet and work out all of your break-evens and opportunity cost of capital and time and freedom. 
maybe we'll make a spreadsheet like that and send it out one day. So in this scenario, if you believe you can make 10%, and by the way, 10% is easy. If you've got a financial education and you know what you're doing, 10% is easy. There's so many products in the world that pay 10% for very little risk. That's like an, that, that to me is like an ultra conservative investment. <clears throat> so if you believe you can make 10%, on, the, on, your 70, on your deposit, okay? And you decide to take the mortgage on the $500,000 property, you're basically speculating that the property will increase in value by 1.8 million over the 30 years. That's the assumption you're making. Now, property speculation has worked well in the Western world in the last couple of generations. Why? Because the population's been growing. But now there's a major issue. Birth rates in the West are plummeting. So think about it. If your country's birth rate is two children per family or just above, the population remains the same over two generations. If it's one, it halves. The population halves. Do you get that? The, building, the buildings will still be there, but there's half the amount of people. So all these, all these people that think they're gonna be you know, renting out properties for the next 50 years and just sitting on a beach somewhere with their feet up drinking Mai Tais, while they make this thing they call passive income. Uh, I'm trying to think where they actually get this assumption from. Because you need people to rent your properties. If the population's half, you're just, you're just gonna be one of those people that ends up with a load of properties that are empty and a shitload of mortgage debt. <clears throat> and it is in the process of halving, literally right now. So it's a massive headwind for GDP growth and property prices in these countries. Do you think it's an accident that what you're seeing in the mainstream media over the last couple of years is basically a massive PR campaign by Western world governments to open the doors to unfettered immigration. Why was this not happening 20 years ago? Why now? Because they know it's coming. I'm not gonna get too political, but <clears throat> the EU, the birth rate's very low. And the UK, if they screw up Brexit, in my opinion, it's the last opportunity that the UK has to sort itself out. If they don't use that as a big opportunity to sort themselves out, it's over. Because when you look at it intergenerationally, things need to happen now in the next 10, 20 years. And the demographic headwind is a major issue for the Western world and the Europe and the UK. The UK is in competition with all these countries and you need bodies. You need babies and you need people coming in. But the right people, people who are gonna to add to the economy and, and create resources and businesses and GDP and jobs. If you don't, it's game over. It will happen in our lifetime if you don't do it. So going back to the mortgages, this pretty much debunks the whole idea that you know, it's really easy to just pop down to the bank, prove your income or do, or do a self-certified mortgage, get a buy to let, and just rent it out to some random. You are now long that mortgage. You don't own the property. The mortgage is a liability. The renter is a liability. You're working for the bank 
not for yourself, and you're going to have to work on that property for 30 years. That does, you know, these numbers don't even assume that you've got all your costs and that you actually have to work. You're not going to be sitting on a beach just collecting rental income. Have we got any landlords here? I'm sure we have. When was the last time you didn't work on a property for a year? You're always on the phone. You're always talking shit to lawyers and accountants and real estate agents and you're always working. You never stop. It's not passive income. That's a lie. Passive is when you sit on your ass, do nothing and money just comes to you. <laughs> it's not passive income. If you want genuine passive income in real estate, has anybody ever invested in real estate investment trusts? I have. I do it all the time. Who else is in REITs? You've got REITs? So real estate investment trusts is, a, is, a, is an asset class which was invented around the 60s in the United States. And there was a bit of an explosion of this asset class in the 80s in the US. And it's been exported everywhere. You can buy real estate investment trusts in America, Canada, UK, all of Europe, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand. They, they, there's literally tens of, there's thousands of them. And what are they? What are they? Well, there's all different types, but the basic premise is you either own or manage real estate and it's wrapped up in a structure called a REIT. Okay. And they're publicly listed. You can trade them on the stock exchange. So you can go out right now and buy one. Okay. And one of them, one of the types is a residential REIT, a residential portfolio manager or owner. Okay. Whatever that company makes, they don't pay tax on it. If they're a registered REIT, okay? But there's a catch. They have to pay 90% of the rental income to their investors by law. So you don't need to own a bricks and mortar to be a landlord and make money out of property. You can buy a REIT and just get an annual dividend and do nothing. You, if you want to sit on a beach and get passive income, buy a residential real estate investment trust that pays a 6 to 9% dividend per year. The landlord, by law, has to pay you 90% of the rental income that they collect. What do they do? They work. What have, you what have you done? You've provided the capital. And what are you doing? You're sitting on your ass on the beach drinking Mai Tais. They manage everything. So there's always opportunity cost. And also, by the way, if the property market does happen to go up in value, the portfolio of the REIT goes up in value and the share price of the REIT goes up. So you're long the stock, you're an investor. So if the property portfolio doubles in value, the, the, the REIT is going to double in value. So you don't miss any of the upside by not buying bricks and mortar. You can participate in the upside as well. But you genuinely do nothing. So I'd encourage you to look at REITs and start looking at the opportunity cost of actually owning something in bricks and mortar. Well, actually you don't. Come on, you've got a mortgage, right? You've got to pay 30 years. I'm saying taking the mortgage and then renting it out and having the renter and having all the nonsense that you have to deal with all the time. It's a liability. It's not an asset. You're not earning passive income. If you make money, it's because you've worked for the property for 30 years and you could have been doing something else. It's all about opportunity cost. So also bear in mind, this example that I've just given is a repayment example. This is the best case scenario. This assumes that you're actually paying down the principal of the debt. 
50% of mortgages now in the West are interest, interest only. So people are taking out the debt and just servicing the debt by paying the interest and never ever paying down the principal. It's madness. And think of the interest rates as well. So we, the example that we've used here was 3.75%. Do you control that? You've got no control over it whatsoever. Your entire financial future rests on the whims of a central bank. So if you're, if you're on a fixed mortgage for say three or four years and you come off that fixed number and interest rates are higher, you're paying a higher mortgage. And you didn't choose to do that, someone else did. So you, you don't have any self-determination in that situation. So again, going right back to the beginning, the system's not perfect. You just need to know the advantages and disadvantages. So if you want to own property, we operate in a system where you are allowed to own property if you want to. But there's various ways you can do it. So you can buy for cash, you can take a mortgage, you can decide, actually, you know what, I don't want to participate. I just want to invest the capital and buy a REIT, let, let the landlord worry about it. There's many, many different ways of doing it. Doing it with a mortgage is the worst way. It's just the worst way. We've also not mentioned here the intangible benefits that you get from just having total freedom. Because it's also freedom of thought. We'll come on to that a bit later with uh, risk, being able to assess risk properly. Because if you don't have total freedom, you can't assess risk objectively. So most people just don't understand this basic stuff about opportunity cost and the options that they have in the world that they have in terms of what they can do with their money. So if you just make some basic assumptions like, well, here's my deposit. If I just grew that at 10% per year, what's my opportunity cost? What do I value my freedom at right now if I take this mortgage? What's my payoff if the property's worth this and this and this and this? And what's my risk? What country am I in? Am I in a country that has a birth rate of one? Okay. I'm in a country that has a birth rate of one, 1 1.2. Well, that means the population's going down 40 to 50% in the next 30, 40 years. Because the previous generation just dies. And then what are you left with? A whole bunch of houses and half the people. So you've got to assess your risk properly. So most people just can't see it. And there's obviously a massive conflict of interest. It's basically the debt market narrative, okay? People, everyone in this room has sold debt through various media channels as a solution to their problems. It's not a solution to your problem. It's a conflict of interest that they want you to believe that debt is the solution. So this myth that you take a mortgage and you own a property is continually pushed and perpetuated until it brainwashes people into thinking that they actually own a property. And that just becomes accepted as, as truth, that if you take a mortgage, you own, the, you own a property. It's obviously not true. You own nothing. So renting to own, very, very important for the principle of self-determination, okay? I would encourage everybody in your early years of life, rent first. Just totally maintain your freedom and buy for cash later, much further down the line, your dream life. Continue to maintain your freedom. In terms of self-determination, true self-determination means you are totally in control of your finances, not somebody else. 
So not a bank. A bank doesn't decide your financial future. Your bank manager doesn't decide your financial future. A central bank doesn't decide your financial future. A government doesn't decide your financial future. Just don't have mortgages. It, 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 it's the worst way to buy property. It's the worst way. Or the worst way to get exposure to owning property. And all the problems that bricks and mortar bring with it. It's a liability. You don't have to worry about it. Let the landlord worry about it. <laughs>